on behalf of this uh, physics of formatter school and the department of physics i welcome you all for this colloquium by professor h r krishnamurthy before i invite him uh, stage to start his uh, talk so i would like to introduce uh, professor krishnamurthy uh, and then we'll see. so um professor krishnamurthy was born in uh, Bangalore, Karnataka, in the year 1951, and uh, he, he did his bachelor's in physics uh, in Bangalore University, and then he studied master's in physics at IIT Kanpur. Then he uh, did another master's in physics at Cornell University, where he also did his PhD with uh, Professor Ken Wilson, about whom he is going to talk of, talk today, and he obtained his PhD degree in the year 70. 78 1978 i think uh, i found found out that he finished his phd requirement in 76 i mean i think uh, two years of joining the phd program and then uh, he uh, joined as research associate at urbana champion and then moved to india uh, to indian social science where he uh, joined as a lecturer and he continued working there and he retired in 2017 as full professor, and then uh, from 2017 he is uh, an honorary professor there at Indian Institute of Science. And uh, um, while working at Indian Institute of Science, he has several visiting and guest professor positions in various parts of the globe. And to highlight some of them, uh, he has been visiting professors at Ohio State University, Princeton University, Harvard University. University of California Davis, uh, Georgetown University, California Riverside, Santa Cruz, several other places. He has supervised many uh, PhD students, and some of them are already eminent researchers in the field, in the field of condensed matter physics. And uh, he has received several awards, and I just want to list a few. Uh, just, I, just, I mean, uh, he received this IBM. Uh, uh, graduate fellowship from uh, IBM Foundation uh, from 1973 to 76, and uh, he was awarded the Science Academy Medal for Young Scientist by the Indian National Science Academy, and he was elected as a young associate of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 1983, and he is an elected fellow of all these Indian Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences. And he was also a project advisory committee member on condensed matter physics and material science of the Department of Science and Technology. And he is the recipient of the D. A. E. Rajaramanna uh, Prize in the year 2000. And uh, uh, he, uh, he has received the Alumni Award for Excellence in Research for Science in 2006 from the Indian Institute of Science. He is also the recipient of the D. C. Bose National Fellowship from D. S. T. And uh, he is an elected fellow of the World Academy of Sciences for the Advancement of Science in Developing Countries in 2011. He is also an American Physical Society fellow. And uh, and recently he is uh, he has been uh, uh, considered as the Science and Engineering Research Board Distinguished Fellow, SCRB Distinguished Fellow. And uh, in between, also, I mean, during his uh, career at IIT, he also have uh, several extended visits and uh, to different institutes and laboratory, including Cabell Institute of Theoretical Physics and Santa Barbara, ICTP Italy, ETH Zurich, ENS Paris, Oxford University, and so on. So uh, he has written several uh, uh, research articles, like hundred, uh, more than 160 research papers. And he has contributed significantly to the field of condensed matter physics. And uh, uh, I mean, just to share some personal experience with uh, uh, Professor H R Krish H R Krishna, who is very well known as H R K in India and abroad as Chris. <laughs> so uh, when I was a PhD student in Bangalore at I A A, he was just 15 kilometers away from us, and my friends at I A A I S C would tell me that we attended H R K's talk. HRK is quantum mechanics class and so on. I was from Indian Institute of Astrophysics Institute, so I was deprived of uh, teaching uh, from people like HRK and all. So I was very jealous uh, with this, uh, when I talked to these people. 
and uh, they would say that hrk is very strong i mean uh, when i uh, somebody will proudly say that okay i entered hrk's office and i discussed science with him and he asked me okay go and go get a printed print out with a red pen then we'll discuss so then i was thinking that maybe he is a very uh, rude or very angry uh, person so my uh, uh, perception changed when i was a postdoc at georgetown university and hrk used to visit georgetown quite often so we met accidentally in one of the common area that is the pantry where he came to i think uh, uh, use the microwave oven i was also used there to use the microwave then we started talking and he was so nice at that time i i mean my, my perception completely changed that he is not the same hrk with whom i saw in isc he was very soft and friendly person okay so uh, with this uh, uh, words i would now like to invite hrk uh, to the stage and i also like to uh, invite our chair person dr anil kumar to welcome him to the stage sure. Can you hear me? Glad that. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, Sapan, for that uh, overly kind introduction. Uh, uh, I hope at least what I say will be uh, clear. Uh, uh, it's as you know. I mean, it's generally not very really easy to give popular or evening lecture. It's much easier to give technical talk. Uh, so i will try my best so i've actually what i've done is uh, the first part of the talk by which i'm hoping that maybe i'll run out of time and uh, it is all story okay so the picture so after that if not you still you know want to go on i can get into some of the technical stuff a little bit okay all right so let's begin So here's the abstract that I put down. So Kenneth, my advisor Kenneth Ken Wilson, you know that universally what he was referred to as Ken Wilson, was a visionary genius whose work on the renormalization group in the early 70s revolutionized the way we think about problems. Uh, and he was awarded the 1980 Nobel Prize in Physics for Well, it's kind of work on one such problem, which is the theory of critical phenomena. I'll tell you a little more about it, hopefully. And uh, ideas and tools he invented have since become part of the standard of theory of physics. I don't know. Probably there was enough time in the school to tell you about knowledge. You, I don't know if it's wrong, but somewhere along the line, especially if you're doing theoretical physics, you will in You will not be able to avoid learning the word phenomenon. And I had the good fortune to be his graduate student at Cornell in 1976. I tell you the story about how it happened that I finished in 76 but got my degree in 78. Tell you the story. But anyway, I will uh, in this talk I have present some cases. I emphasize some because it's just time is not enough to tell you what. Many more. It will be a small number of cases of them and those work, and some recollections of how I ended up working with them and interacting with them. So popular lecture, but 
come, if I want to tell him, tell you about his work, it's very difficult to not get technical. So that part may be a little bit, but that will be in the end. Okay. All right. So Ken Wilson, the early years. So Kenneth Wilson was born in June 1936 in Waltham, Massachusetts in a family with very strong intellectual tradition. His father was E. Bright Wilson, Jr., a very well-known theoretical chemist in the chemistry department of Harvard University. And he was a student of Linus Pauling, PhD student of Linus Pauling. And he's a famous author of a book called Introduction to Quantum Mechanics by Pauling and Wilson. In our, you know, in our times, that was like a very standard textbook. If you wanted to learn quantum mechanics, you went to either uh, this book by Pauling and Wilson or book by Schiff or Merzbacher and so on. These days, he may be using other books. But this was a very well book. And he also worked on, uh, and there was a book by molecular vibration. And he was a pioneer in the studies of molecular structure. His father. His mother, Emily Buckingham Wilson had one year of graduate work in physics before her marriage. His maternal grandfather was a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, and his paternal grandfather was a lawyer, one time speaker of the Senate of the family of high achiever intellectuals. So he was brought up in that kind of atmosphere, and he showed his promise very early, as I will see, as I will, you will see. He is schooling in uh, uh, various schools in Massachusetts. For a year, I think, when his father was on sabbatical in England, he attended a Magdalene College school in ninth grade. And so you can see he entered, actually, he, he did second, third, fourth grades in two years. And after he came back from England, he skipped the 11th grade and finished the rest of high school. In, uh, in two years. And so he was kind of early uh, when he entered college compared to other students. Uh, and about this early period, he says, this is a quote, and I quote, before the year in England, I had read about mathematics and physics in books supplied by my father and his friends. I learned the basic principles of calculus from uh, mathematics and by, imagination by Kastner and Newman and went went on to work through a calculus stuck text until I got stuck in a chapter on involute and evolute. I don't know how many of you know. I don't even know what involute and evolute are, but anyway, there must have been a classic calculus text and he said he got stuck. And I think this, if I remember right, this was in his, uh, around his ninth grade and completely learned calculus. Around this time, I decided to become a physicist and later, before entering college, I remember working on symbolic logic with my father. He also tried unsuccessfully to teach me group theory. And he says, concludes, I, I found high school dull. OK, uh, that's the story about his uh, childhood. So he entered Harvard because he kind of skipped two years of school, essentially, and learned it was compressed everything into that. He entered Harvard at 19, in 1952 at age 15. And he majored in mathematics, but studied physics. He says both by intent. It was like a very deliberate choice on his part that he would major in mathematics, but he had already made up his mind that he was going to be a physicist. And he was a Putnam fellow in 1954 and 1956. So for those of you who don't know, this, uh, this is an annual mathematics competition called the William Lowell Putnam Mathematics Competition. It's one of the most prestigious math competitions in the US. And one of the, he was one of the top five scorers. So the way they create this math, math competition is apparently they separate, they select the top five scorer, but they don't rank order them because they, they are all equal basically. So he took it twice and in both times he was uh, within the top five scorers, and they get a prize, um, $2,500 of the But um, so 
So there are very some very other prominent winners that come up whose names you may recognize, who are also Putnam fellow in this week. So Richard Feynman in 1939, Robert Mills, uh, uh, you know, if you know quantum field theory, is a thing called the Yang and Mills theory, which is like the foundation of all all of modern uh, you know uh, quantum field theories. Uh, and uh, C. P. Wu, Jorkin, you know, if you ever learn relative to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, there's a famous textbook by Bjorken and Ralph, where that came to Bjorken, was a professor at Platt in Stanford, Steve Adler, Barry Simon, and Peter Shore, one of the most recent. Shore is a pioneer in quantum computing. So he invented this thing called Shore's algorithm. Which tells you if you had how if you had a quantum computer, you can factorize uh, a very huge number, which is a product of two prime numbers. If I give you that, you won't be able to do it on ordinary computer. It's big enough. But sure, sure that if you have a quantum computer, you can do it in polynomial time. And in fact, that was like really gave a big impetus to the rush for you know getting quantum computers going because. I don't know how many of you know that this, um, you know, all the encryption in uh, transactions is based on uh, the difficulty in factorizing products of two prime, prime numbers without knowing one of them. Okay, so if you know, in, including uh, you know, national security communications between embassies and government and security forces. So if somebody got hold of one computer, all that. Security is broken. So the government agencies want to get hold of the quantum computer first. So they are funding it in big ways. Do you? So, anyway, so sure, is a Putnam. So Wilson was in a very special company when he got out of Harvard. So he was also a star, you know, very multifaceted person. He was a star on the athletic track. He was part of the Harvard track team, which ran the mile and cross country. So, you know, if you ever saw him, he was very slim and fit. I mean, and even at Cornell, he would do swimming and then he would do running. And he began research even as, as an undergraduate student working in summer, summer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute with a person called Arnold B. Aaron, who was then a professor at Amherst on various problems in oceanography. And it's which included sound propagation in an ocean that had a layer at the top of constant temperature and sound velocity, and then something called the thermocline, which is a layer in which the temperature decreases rapidly with increasing depth. And it has all kinds of uh, exotic properties because of this. And Wilson did a very thorough study of that and another project, osmotic pressure of seawater and so on. And in, in a 2000 interview, he said about this work. That I came to Caltech in 1956 after this uh, period in Harvard. But what I didn't realize was that for all practical purposes, I already completed a PhD working with Arnold Aaron, specifically during junior and senior years. I did a project, I wrote it up, it was never really published, but it could have been. So basically, during the period here, I just finished what would have been for most people a PhD thesis, but okay, he didn't publish it, and I have never seen. Like um, papers of about this book. Okay, so then he joined graduate school at Caltech, and he was in principle graduated in 1960. And he, I, somewhere I, you know, Wilson thanks the National Science Foundation for support during his graduate work. So I'm guessing he probably entered as a NSF doctoral fellow. And he worked initially in the Kellogg Laboratory of Nuclear Physics, gaining experimental experience while taking theory courses. So you might wonder. And then in the summer, he spent the summer at the General Atomic Company in San Diego, working with Marshall Rosenbluth in plasma physics, and also interacted with S. Chandrasekhar, who was visiting there for the summer. So, in particular, he was very fascinated by the guiding center approximation for the motion of particles in, you know, like charged particles in constant magnetic fields and almost constant magnetic fields in plasma. 
So you may wonder why, you know, he was already bent on mathematics and theoretical physics. Why did he take up experimental uh, physics and try other things and not come to elementary, you know, particle physics and quantum field theory, which was his, uh, you know, obsession most of his life. So there's a story around it, apparently. I mean, uh, you know, uh, as he told somebody, his father had instructed him that when he went to Caltech, he must meet all the professors and introduce himself to them. So uh, Wilson apparently went and knocked on the door of Feynman and Gelman, who were the most famous you know, theorists there in his field of interest. And so he knocked on Feynman's door and, uh, you know, Feynman said, uh, who is that? In a very gruff voice. So Wilson knocked again and then uh, Feynman, which sort of grudgingly came to the door and opened it. And then Wilson told him that he is a graduate student who's just joined Caltech and uh, he wants to know what is uh, Feynman working on. So apparently Feynman said nothing and then shut the door in its face. <laughs> so <laughs> when Wilson went to Gelman, and Gelman was uh, more polite and he let him enter the room and, Wilson, you know, again, Wilson introduced himself and asked Gelman what he was working on. And apparently Gelman said he's trying to solve the 3D writing model. And it'd be nice if Wilson can solve it. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so he kind of maybe got teased off uh, and said, okay, let me try experimental uh, physics for a while. So he joined experimental thing. But nevertheless, he kept, you know, because of his interest in his theory, he, anyway, he was just kind of, he knew that it was like a self made math. He, he worked things out by himself and almost did a thesis earlier. So, anyway, he took experimental courses and Anyway, experimental work in the lab and then uh, took theory courses and you know all the usual stuff including on field theory and various stuff and worked in Cosmos. And then he came back and asked Gelman for a PhD thesis problem. So he might say, hey, how come? What happened? So apparently he did a fair amount of work on Cosmos physics. And he said after about one or two months. So they said, let's write it up. So you're going to have to write a paper there. And Wilson said he hated that idea. And he swore that he was going to work in a field where he can work for many years without having to publish a paper. So he said, let me go back to the mentee party. So he went and talked to Gelmar. And asked him for a problem. And apparently, Gelman suggested some particular problem. And Wilson, he worked on it for a month and he didn't like it and went back to him. And he said, Gelman was nice. He, he seemed to be able to come up with problems, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat with no problem, but you know, being able to suggest problems. So he suggested something else. And that was something called the fixed stored meson nucleon uh, theory. It's about how like a fixed nucleus interacts with mesons. So it involves a combination of strong and weak interactions as a messy problem. And there was some work already on that by uh, Francis Lowe. Uh, and he had set down something called the Lowe equation. Uh, which, you know, I won't get into the technical details of this. But what, and Wilson found by uh, studying that equation, he was very unimpressed with the way people had tried to solve that equation by approximation. So he found, he started analyzing uh, the high energy uh, limits of that equation. You know, when you look at that equation uh, and look at it, how, you know, it has momenta as argument for uh, whatever is being calculated. And if you look at high momentum, he found that that equation simplified and he could get exact solutions. So he was kind of, you know, he was basically a very unusual kind of thing, not think like everybody else, but think in a uh, very orthogonal ways, and he would find all these clever things. So he says basically uh, his um, thesis 
was a mismatch of curious calculation. There were many different things, a bunch of stuff. And during this period, he also learned about something called the Gelman law, you know, group, which I will tell you about later in the technical part of the discussion. Okay. So, and this fixed source meson nuclear problem also has some connection both with RD and some, something else that I will tell you about called the condo problem. Okay. So, actually, so work with is kind of a, and it, I mean, I put it in quotes, but I think the way it probably happened was that Kelman would suggest various problems to him and then Wilson would go off and work on her own and come up with something very original and inventive to impress uh, the guy. Uh, and uh, it went like that. And then actually after, so by the time he finished third year, I mean, I think they had basically concluded that he had done enough work for a PhD thesis. So he worked, probably worked with Gelman for about a year or two, no, no more than that, leaving out the summer. So it, they said, they seem to think that he had put enough, uh, put in enough, uh, on, done enough to complete a thesis. And Gelman went off on some sabbatical leave to Europe, to Paris. And then I, they recommended him and he won a very prestigious junior fellowship from the Harvard Society of Fellows. This is like a you know, um, honor society in Harvard, which funds uh, the postdoctoral fellows and they call junior fellows. Very large, very competent. And Wilson, apparently, Wilson's father was also a fellow of this Harvard Society of Fellows, 25 years earlier than Wilson. And Wilson's father and Wilson are the only father son duo of uh, Harvard Junior Fellows. Okay. So Gelman was away. So after his third year, Wilson went off without getting his PhD, without submitting his thesis, he went off to Harvard. And then he says he came back for a few months, this would have been in September 1969, and then he came back for a few months in 1960 to finish his thesis containing, as I said, a mismatch of curious calculations and uh, with fascinating connections to later work, which I will hopefully come to. And the formalities were handled by Feynman as Gelman was away. So apparently, uh, there's another story connected with this, this thesis. Uh, you know, they had to give a seminar and they completed the thesis and so on. So Feynman was supervising the seminar and one of the, so Wilson presented all this work and then one of the, somebody from the audience said, it's all very nice and elegant, but what's the use? So Feynman apparently said, looked at that guy and said, don't look at a gift card in the mouth. All right. So, and then in uh, some interview, uh, uh, Wilson also says, while at Caltech, he talked a lot. I talked a lot with John Matthews, who is another faculty member there, then a junior faculty member who also works on particle physics. He's the author of, I don't know how many of you have used this book called Matthews and Walker, Mathematical Method of Such a, you know, it's like a book I love. I mean, like this is the book that we used as a textbook when we were learning mathematical methods of physics. And he's one of the authors of that. And he was interested in computer. So Wilson got talking to him and he taught Wilson, what taught me, Wilson says, how to use the Institute computer, which is actually a Burroughs machine running on uh, paper tape. Remember, we're talking about 1950. So the machine running on paper tape. I don't, see, you know, you, you have to go to a museum to see those machines. But, uh, and if you needed to program that computer, you had to learn assembly language, so it was like machine language. So Wilson actually learned that. So, and then uh, learned to use that and maybe use that to do some of the calculation with the six shows, maybe on UPM. So it was very, very interested in getting numbers, you know, he was not satisfied with analytical formulae and analytical solutions and all. He, if, if he saw an equation, he wanted to produce numbers. That was his fascination from the beginning. And then so this is the beginning of his fascination with computers. So more about that. So then he came to Harvard as a junior fellow, 
for Sandho 59 to 62. And he worked primarily on S matrix theory, which he says the fashion of that time. And he was going often to MIT to use their computer, because Harvard didn't have a computer at that time, apparently, and to eat lunch with MIT theory group led by Francis Lowe. And he continued to work on the side on the fixed source meson nuclear problem, uh, you know, which is a critical problem, where he had looked at some particular limit, you know, and high energy limit and uh, solved the problem, which was like a weak coupling limit. Uh, and then he wanted to understand what it does in the strong coupling limit. He was trying to use the computer to solve that problem, et cetera. And then he spent a calendar year, calendar year of 1962 at CERN, first as the Harvard Junior Fellow, because that extended to 62, and then as a Ford Foundation Fellow. And he said in this, Period, he went on a climb of Mount Blanc, which is the highest uh, peak in Europe, with uh, a couple of other people, and spent January to August 1963 touring Europe. And he basically wrote his first few papers, are from this period. There's, uh, you know, it's all over the place. I mean, something called the proof of a conjecture by Dyson. About which is a Dyson conjecture in random access theory, a, something about Reggie pole theory, which is closely connected, and this uh, multi, multi, multiple production, multi particle production connected with this metric theory. Okay. So, this was a paper he published. Okay. And then he came to Cornell at 1963, in September 1963, as an assistant professor. And he received tenure as an associate professor in 1965, despite publishing only one paper during this period. From um, after he joined the corner to 65, he had three papers earlier and had only one paper during this period. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of discussion about you know how, how did did he have trouble getting tenure? And some people say yes, he had trouble, but. Uh, Cornell had this very well-known and famous professor called Hans Bethe, who you know won the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, like a demigod of uh, uh, theoretical physics. And he said, "Just leave him alone. Give him tenure and leave him alone." And that's one of the stories. And there's also another. Uh, Wilson apparently told somebody, like Francis Lowe, who from MIT, who was interacting with him. He was um, scolding Wilson, saying, why did you publish a paper? He should have not published any. And then that would have been, you know, he could have checked whether you would have got tenure without any paper. That would have been uh, something uh, new. But anyway, so he said he got tenure. And at least he was not worried about it, obviously. And because, you know, like you can see everywhere, you get the impression that people just, uh, you know, awed by him. Despite, uh, you know, because four publications at that time would have been not much. They were, I'm pretty sure there must be other people who were publishing many, many more papers. So anyway. So and then he also says actually that he came to Cornell. I came to Cornell in response to an unsolicited offer I received while at front. That means he didn't apply for a faculty position at Cornell, but he was sought out by people there who had heard of him by reputation and so on. And then he accepted the offer because Cornell was a good university, was out in the country, and was reputed to have a good folk dancing group. And folk dancing being a hobby I had taken up as a graduate. So that's how he came to Cornell. All right. And then once he was there, he remained at Cornell. It was a very good move in retrospect. He remained at Cornell until 1988, uh, except for you know, Leeds and some of it is in 69 to 70, he was at Slack in Stanford, Spring of 72 was Princeton, Paul of and which guy said, and Mentoning uh, and Breaking, Zurich. Other than that, he stayed in Calpet, I mean Cornell. So I guess we have to be thankful for his interest in folk dancing and Cornell having the folk dancing group because his presence at Cornell was like crucial to the entire story of renormalization movement itself now. Okay. All right.
So, from the time that uh, in uh, he 63 uh, or 65 when he got uh, 10 years to when he became the weak professor in 24, roughly, this is the number of his productivity exploded. Basically. You know, there's a number of papers. Suppose, you know, if you count papers, this is like uh, 24 papers and 10 years. That's, you might say, you know, what's a big thing? It's two and a half papers. But the issue is, they, it, it like uh, started five different fields, basically. So the impact was incredible. Okay. So let me tell you about this. So there, there were basically five major threads of research in this, uh, among this paper that I've listed. So one is called, goes in the name of operator product expansion. It's something that's equally applicable to statistical mechanical systems, near critical, now critical point, or in quantum field theory. It's, you know, so again, you know, without getting technical, roughly all of you know that when we do quantum field theory or statistical me mechanics, we break, we basically concerned with some sort of uh, probability distributions, if you if I were to use that phrase in a sort of a very generic thing. For in a quantum field theory, also if you use it in like if you put it in a language of functional integrals and path integrals and so on, you can use that same language. They basically there are some probability amplitude for uh, distributions of fields in space, and then you have to average things over them. Okay, and the simplest average is when if I take the field at one point and the field at another point and ask what is the average and how does that average depend on the distance between the two points. So when uh, things are like near critical point, at critical point, for example, these, these products of uh, uh, up the average of the product of operator falls off with distance like a power law. There's like an exponent there. So it's called the anomalous dimension of you know, the operator. So basically, Wilson was kind of develop, you know, in this process, he was basically setting out, setting down rules for how if you take products of various complicated sets of operators, what kind, you know, like you can expand that in terms of products of a few operators and so on. So it's a very powerful tool for calculating uh, uh, ex expectation values, average values of products of operators, and has connections to all kinds of uh, fields like conformal field theory and many, many aspects. So he wrote a lot of papers, and in particular, it had connections to, uh, there were lots of experiments being done at that time, called deep inelastic electron scattering, which is electron with very high energy for being bombarding, used to bombard uh, protons. So they went deep and interacted with quarks, actually, rather than with the protons themselves. And, and in that context, these quarks behaved as if it turned out that a lot of the you know properties of that scattering could be explained by assuming that the nucleons were made up of what they, what were known called partons, okay, which, which is like almost non-interact. There are many of them, but they are not interacting very strongly with each other, which is like peculiar because you would normally think the quarks are very strongly bound inside that. Anyway, as, as I was hopefully tell you later, this is actually another mystery that Wilson and Andre will like tell you how it how exactly it happened. But uh, Wilson and other people, Andre will later. But at that time, it was very clear. So in fact, this name was given by Feynman. And so some of this work that Wilson did on operator product expansion has to do with uh, this field. Okay. All right, so that's a whole set of papers on uh, uh, current algebra and uh, operator product expansion. And then, uh, then he invented, he went back to that fixed source meson nuclear problem. And I was telling you, he was, uh, you know, figuring out what happens in the strong coupling. Okay. 
then he figured out that by um, you know earlier i told you that he worked on that problem in the limit of high momentum and then figured out there, there was uh, an analytical solution that he could get in that limit but the low momentum thing involved strong coupling and then what he found out was that if he took the entire range of momenta that were involved and broke them up into many slices which were disconnected slices now one big slice at very high momenta another big slice another slice of momentum at a slightly lower momentum a third slice and and kept going all the way in a kind of a log fashion right he could sort of set up the problem so that and the ratio of the momentum slices you know where they were located became like a small parameter and the coupling could be large but he could use that and then he set up uh that problem and so he could investigate it how it behaved both in high momentum and low momentum without making an approximation of small coupling constants or expansion in that and he showed that there is actually uh, you can talk about coupling constant renormalization etc without the crutch of perturbation theory so there is a very important step forward in understanding whereas you know if you look at the whole concept of renormalization that people uh, did earlier is then in quantum field theory when you try to do this problem you know you get integrals running from low momentum to high momentum and then in fact momentum infinite if the momentum is infinite the integrals are at divergent and you get stuck and then so people basically said that if i ignore that divergence and say pretend there is a high momentum cut off and then you can reabsorb all of that and into the a moment a coupling constant at low momentum scales and if you rewrite the problem and you know all the perturbation theory in terms of dot everything is well behaved so that's the whole program of renormalization which uh, seems like magic you know there was no way people could justify it but so he Wilson basically hooked up a model problem where he could clearly see how it came about and this was like actually his beginning of his whole understanding of renormalization group so he basically worked it out in context and then he wrote many other papers uh using this kind of this kind of basically was his um um what our launched him into this whole renormalization group theory ideas and then he wrote many other influential papers in the field so i have taken all this thing from the google scholar citation index and these numbers in blue that you are seeing are like the citation in the sphere of the google okay first the big thing he did was this uh, renormalization group and critical phenomena okay yeah. uh, so he wrote two papers on this hopefully i don't know whether i'll have time to tell you about this but uh, anyway so these were the most important papers that he wrote uh, starting launching that whole field so he derived something called an uh, approximate recursion relation between coupling constants uh, which is in the form of an integral equation okay so then he was talking you know this 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 work happened because he was at cornell and cornell had this uh, legendary figure in field of critical phenomena in the name of ben midam uh, in uh, chemistry department and michael fisher who was actually a professor of physics chemistry and mathematics and written got started talking to him and then in realized that all his struggles about renormalization in quantum field theory and had some connection with uh, uh, what was going on in critical phenomena and where there was some early work by cadenoff uh, whose work was actually just like the something called the gelman low renormalization group it was analog of that and then wilson had got away from that and then he suddenly realized that he knew how to tackle this problem where nobody else did and he said about doing that and then he got the paper on the and then 
Fisher noticed that his equations, which I will uh, show you later if I have time, had a simplicity, simplicity if the dimensionality was close to 4. If the dimensionality of the system above 4, then what you've learned, you know, you must have learned something called Fury Weiss mean field theory, right? You must, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you have learned that uh, in when you do simple magnetic systems and so on. So, above that, it's this Fury Weiss kind of mean field theory or Landau Ginsburg theory, all is exact. Whereas below that is when you get critical exponents which are don't agree with that, etc. And Wilson noticed, I mean, Fisher noticed that there's a simplification that occurs if the dimensionality is below four, but close to four. So they invented the difference between four and D as epsilon as an expansion parameter. And they found lo and behold that, you know, Wilson didn't have to do that a complicated integral equation exercise. He, uh, expanded in power of epsilon, and they became simple algebraic equations, the renormalization group equation, and they could solve it analytically. And, and so they wrote this paper called Critical Phenomena in 3.99 dimension. It was a sensation because everybody realized suddenly that that whole field like exploded, you know. I mean, like I was in fact, I happened to join Cornell in 72. And the amount of activity that was going on there in critical phenomena was just it was like the mecca for critical phenomena. You know, lots of people would land up, including postdocs, etc. And they were calculating critical phenomena, I mean, critical exponents and phase transitions, every system that people had struggled with earlier. Okay. And suddenly the whole field was broken open with this development. And in fact, Wilson, because he was such an expert in quantum field theory, he realized that actually he didn't even need renormalization. He recognized that this epsilon expansion, uh, epsilon is a small parameter. You could just go back to standard quantum field theory uh, as applied to statistical mechanics problems and use epsilon as a small parameter and then turn out, you know, to many orders in epsilon. Uh, I think he went to second or third order in epsilon. He could turn out critical exponents, all the things that people were studying with. So that is his paper. So anyway, so there's a, a bunch of papers connected to this. So if those of you, you know, I probably will not get to tell you much about the technical aspects of this. So if you're interested, if you want a very wordy uh, description, which I particularly don't like because I think it hides. But anyway, Wilson struggled very hard to explain. He put in a lot of energy into writing this article on problem of physics from many scales of length in Scientific American. It's a very wordy explanation of his renormalization group ideas. So you're welcome to go take a look. Maybe maybe some of you will enjoy it and learn, learn from it. So that was uh, thread number three. Thread number four, he invented a numerical renormalization group approach to solve something called the condo problem. Did Subroto tell you about the condo problem? Huh? Okay, so he was thinking that he will tell you, but I, I remember talking to him. But anyway, let's see if I have time. If you have patience to listen, you want to listen, I will be tell, able to tell you a little bit about what is this problem. It actually has very close connection with this fixed source meson nucleon problem that Wilson worked on. So I was telling you, he, he in this case, it's actually an impurity, like a magnetic impurity interacting with conduction electrons. So the only scale in the problem is the energy scale of the conduction electrons which are interacting with, you know, there's a, like a Fermi level and the, you know, the uh, conduction electrons have some energy up to some cutoff scale, right? So there are many, many con conduction electron scales, which all of them interacting with, with one impurity. And it's bit, very much like uh, a nucleon interacting with mesons, okay? It's close connections to that. And then, this momentum slice thing, which I was telling you sort of roughly about, he basically found that there he had sliced it and ignored lots of momenta. He said here he found a way to make it like contiguous momentum slices and invented a numerical technique to actually solve that problem. It's like the first 
completely numerical renormalization to calculate and it doesn't care about whether the coupling constant is weak or strong and it solved like a long standing problem in condensed matter physics and he actually reported this in a uh, collective proposition there's a nobel symposium that was not held in it was never held in 72 i think but uh, he reported there he didn't he never wrote a paper on it he wrote a review article describing all the details of it uh, in this uh, review of modern physics together with some additional things about critical phenomena uh, whereas the earlier renormalization group work that he did is all his work and many others work is in this uh, fantastic uh, review article that wilson uh, wrote he actually gave us set of I, i was telling you earlier that he went spent a little bit of time in visiting princeton uh, and then he gave sort of lectures on his renormalization group work and john forgot was uh, in the audience he took notes and they wrote wrote up that together uh, and that was published as a scientific video and it's an outstanding thing to tell to if you want to know what about rt with 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 the technical details that's the place to study okay then then he did something else just around that time the whole business of uh, non abelian gauge theory you know which is connected with thing i was mentioning to the name of mill yang mill right which is i presume all of you have learned electrodynamics and know that there is something called gauge in there so the quantum version of that the quantum electrodynamics which feynman and von works on as uh, this gauge you know, freedom yeah. so then the yang and mill worried about fields where the, uh, you know fields which are like non abelian that means uh, you know um the gauge symmetry group is not an abelian group but some non abelian like su2 su3 or whatever whatever right so how to generalize gauge theory for that so they they had worked that out and then around this time that um cross and wilcheck and politzer found out that if to analyze the diagrammatic perturbation theory for such thing those gauge theories have a property a very interesting property called asymptotic freedom which is that the coupling constant like for quantum electrodynamics the coupling constant if you were to keep calc if you fix the coupling constant at low energies and calculate what the effective coupling constant and high energy is it diverges whereas in this theory if you fix the coupling constant at low energies and then calculate what the coupling constant at high energy is it decreases and decreases that means perturbation theory gets better and better at high, high energy scale so that's called asymptotic freedom so wilson got very interested in the non abelian gauge theory but he said he was lazy to learn all the stuff that other people had done about non abelian stuff etc so you know he's very like orthogonal person he wants to do things by himself in his own way so what he did is let me invent a latest version of the gauge theory which doesn't have all these cut off problems etc right so he basically constructed for himself how would you build gauge symmetry uh in a lattice model okay and basically nobody had done that until then and he found a way to do that and he found that interestingly that lattice problem was actually easier to solve in the strong coupling limit rather than the weak coupling limit. and uh, it becomes a bit like high temperature series expansion in statistical mechanics etc so he found that in that limit quarks for example if you try to separate quarks in that limit he found that the effective interaction in three you know like the, you have to pay more and more energy if you try to separate the quarks so they are like confined you know it costs too much energy to separate quarks so basically he found an explanation for why quarks form a bound state at low energy forming u3 even though at high energy scale at high energy scale this lattice t 
theory behaves like sort of uh, the continuum theory as well, uh, and there will be asymptotic freedom. So basically, that's the paper that we wrote called confinement of what, basically launching the field of lattice case theory, and that is the highest cited paper. Here. So it's like you know each of these five things that I've told you about is like a path breaking thing, but it's an amazing thing that they did in these. In this period, okay. Then, of course, you know, it became very well known, and uh, you know, college followed, and that was around the time when I. Um, so, I should tell you a little bit about my experience that and how I ended up working working with them. So, I joined Cornell as a graduate student in the fall of '72 after completing a master's degree in physics from IIT Kanpur. So, amongst the places I got admitted to, I was able to eliminate. Uh, all but Caltech and Cornell relatively easily. But you know, I was really in a dilemma should I go to Cornell or should I go to Caltech? And of course, Caltech were at that time the most, fam most famous place with famous people like Feynman and Gelman. And I did have an interest in uh, particle physics and quantum field theory and so on. So I was very tempted to go there. And also, they had offered me a fellowship, whereas Cornell. Uh, gave me only a teaching assistant if I would have to go and teach, uh, you know, teach 20 hours a week to earn my living there. So I was very tempted to go to Caltech. Uh, but I finally decided to go to Cornell after talking to some of my professors at IIT Kanpur, uh, namely Professor Ramkrishnan and Professor Bunny. So one of the things they pointed out was that Cornell had a good for high energy physics group, including Wilson and other people. And they also had an outstanding condensed matter theory group. So if I had to, if I wanted to keep my options open that whether, whether I want, what kind of physics I want to do, uh, I'm better off going to Cornell and I don't lose much because Cornell is also very, very good. And maybe you know, Feynman and uh, Gelman had a little bit of reputation as not necessarily needed to be work with, and so on. So, whatever they told me, whatever they told me convinced me. So, um, I went off to Cornell. Uh, I had a classmate, Deepak Char. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. Okay, he was a classmate in IIT. He also had an offer from Caltech, but he, he decided to go to Caltech. Uh, you might have thought that he go to Caltech and do uh, particle physics. No, went to Caltech, interacted primarily with Matthews. I, when I told you, was ended up doing statistical mechanics, and you know came back to India and uh, you know as you know, he's been outstanding level. Recently won the Boltzmann Medal. So he's, you know, just to point out that these stories that we tell about, you know, choices etc. They're not necessarily true, but still, you make the choice, and then that determines uh, your trajectory in the future. So that's unavoidable, right? That's the way life is. Okay, but anyway, I made a choice, and you know, it was a fantastic choice as it happened. So amongst the flyers I received from the physics department at Cornell, there was one with a list of recent publications from their faculty. You know, they sent as like a, you know, what for all people, and there was. Ken Wilson's name figured prominently that year it happened that his figure, you know, it, if it was like a few years earlier, his name wouldn't have figured at all because he didn't have any publication. But that year, in that flyer, there were four papers and three of them with the renormalization group in their titles, in particular, the renormalization group in critical phenomena one, renormalization group in critical phenomena two, and Couple of other papers. Also, of course, very intrigued. That's you know, I learned a little bit about renormalization, etc., in the context of field theory. So I was obviously intrigued. It was this renormalization group, uh, and what is the connection with critical phenomena? What the hell? I've never heard of this stuff. So I went to the IIT Kanpur library and looked up these papers, read through them, couldn't make, just didn't understand it. But I could sense that they were very important. But I was not able to understand it because. I didn't have uh, the necessary background. So anyway, so um, I went to Cornell. So by the time I arrived at Cornell, 
epsilon expansion, that 3.99 damage, that paper also out and the field has slowed edge. And there was a clear consensus that Ken Wilson had achieved the performance rate. Okay. So, physics department those days had a system that a committee of four wise men, as they were called, was designated every year to advise the entering graduate students. And Wilson was one of those four wise men. And by a stroke of luck, I was assigned to him. He was my uh, wise man advisor. Okay. So I went to him soon after my arrival and I said that uh, I asked him whether I could skip the first year graduate courses in quantum mechanics and you know some other stuff which I felt I knew. Right. So he said he'll have to give me an exam. So I said, okay. So he gave me an exam in quantum mechanics. And I answered it and gave it to him. And he evaluated it. And then I came back to talk. And I went back to talk to him. He said, Why don't you skip all the first year courses? So, and then he said, uh, He said, instead, credit the second year courses, including a special topic course he was teaching in the fall term on the renormalization group and the epsilon expansion. From this note, actually, this uh, Wilson and Cogut article I told you about was available as cyclostyle notes at that time. And, you know, type, types and cyclostyle, I don't know, any of you relate to the word cyclostyle? Okay, you can say zero copy. You know, basically, they're typed up and then somebody runs out using a machine, umpteen copies of that. That's all. So that was the way in for many, you know, right? There were no printers and all. That's not this type of print I'm here. So, and even not even, I'm not even sure zero copy. Okay, so these are the notes, and that was the note for the basic material for that course. So, I actually attend, attended that course, but you know, I had this hang up at that time that of not willing to learn something completely new and making the effort to learn it. And I sort of Back, go back and say, I don't know the prerequisites and sort of close my mind a little bit, which is like a mistake in that. I got over that eventually. But at that time, I felt that, that I didn't know enough quantum field theory. I hadn't had a formal course in statistical mechanics, and I didn't know all the background. And suddenly, he was talking about critical phenomena, Gaussian model, functional engineering, and all kind of stuff that I had no the foggiest notion about. I said, I need to learn this background before crediting this course. So I talked to him and he agreed, you know, I dropped crediting it. So I was really worried that I would fail in the course if I credited it. But I sat in the lecture and listened to what he was uh, lecturing and tried to do the homework, etc. So anyway, uh, so because of that, I actually didn't have much interaction with him for the rest of that year, except for uh, occasional meetings with him to find papers as my advisor. Okay, I'm getting to the end of this story. So at the end of my first year, I was very clear. So in fact, in that summer, I actually tried, uh, you know, just my hand at experiment. I, but because I had actually an experimental course fulfillment. So I actually went and worked with a person called Bob Berman and, you know, made up made circuits for him and did all kinds of experimental work. And at the end of that, decided I, I want to be a theorist. So I was very clear that I wanted to do theory. And I wanted to work on problems in RG and critical phenomena. So I went, went back to Ken and asked him whether I could work with him. He said basically yes, that he would be happy to have, him, have me work with him. But by that time, he had switched his interest. You know, this was uh, late, you know, this was in year 73 already over. He had finished off all his work on critical phenomena, including the condo problem also. He had finished that work. And he had just done this work on lattice gate theory that I told you about. So his entire interest was in concentrated in that because that was like a problem, right? We're completely going to solve. If you solve that problem, it's completely going to help you understand how quarks form protons and neutrons and whatever, everything, entire physics of elementary particles, starting from asymptotic freedom, small coupling constants, drawing to things, determining masses, everything, right? That was his ambition. So he, he was going to work on that. So he said, am I willing to work on that? I was somehow very hesitant. I had already kind of made up my mind that I wanted to do condensed particles. So 
then he said, why don't I go talk to Michael Fisher? So I went and talked to Michael. Michael, you know, I presume he might have said, talk to Michael about me. So Michael was happy to take me on as a student. So in fact, he right away gave me an office in his uh, group, uh, which is called the Baker Building, which is a chemistry building. So I was sitting there for a year, actually, from that time. So I, then after my first year. So, and I talked to him. And then there I met David Nelson, who was a whisk kid, who was in this thing called the six-year PhD program, okay, at Cornell. It's a, like a new program that they have started. Basically, they take the students after high school, right? And in six years, they finished off undergraduate courses, graduate courses, and the PhD thesis. And Nelson was one of the success stories. Okay, he was a really brilliant guy. And I had a lot of fun, you know, interacting with him, talking to him. But, and Michael Fisher had already started him on some renormalization group problem. For some reason, he was reluctant to start me on another problem, maybe because he thought he will end up competing, whatever. So he was trying to get me interested in some other problems in statistical mechanics that he was interested in. I looked at them, worked on them a little bit, but I said, no, nah, I didn't. I don't feel really interested in this stuff. Okay. So that was where I was. I was puttering around, not knowing where I, where, where I was going around this time. And then, Okay, then um, so one which I call a momentous day. I was in uh, in a colloquium at the end of a colloquium after a department colloquium. Uh, these three people, Ken Wilson, Michael Fisher, and John Wilkin, accosted me, saying, "Hey, talk to someone. I, we want to talk to you." Okay. <laughs> John Wilkin actually is a very funny person. I mean, he's no more, but he was like a full of uh, fantastic humor, etc. I had actually never met him until that time because he was away on a sabbatical. And then uh, I'd only heard of him, but didn't know what he looked like too, actually. Because if you went to the departmental notice board in Cornell and, you know, they had everybody's picture there, right? In John Wilkins, you know, there was a name, John Wilkins, and the picture was of <laughs> Nixon. <laughs> So anyway, so he came, uh, all three of them came. So the first thing that he says, you know, we, you know, they introduced him to me because I had not met him earlier, John Wilson. And, you know, so the first thing he says after uh, I was introduced, he said, so you are the sucker, he says. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. So anyway, but it turned out what they had was, they had a proposal for a research project for me to take on. Because a little prior to that, I, as I've told you, Wilson had completed the invention of this new technique called the numerical renormalization and used it to solve the condo problem connected in MIT to the school. And it was announced already, details are not published. And the proposal was to have me explore the extension of this technique to a more microscopic model called the Anderson impurity model. Okay, so that was the proposal. So they, you know, got together and thought that it might be a good problem for me to do. I, I always feel very humble and amazed that somebody in the background is kind of looking out for these things. And so, you know, they asked me. So I said, okay, I'll take a look at it. So I, Wilson gave me some handwritten notes for the work on the condo problem. And uh, I looked up some of the literature on the quantum pretty problem. What I read up, I didn't know a thing about what the condo problem was, I was under the impurity model, I read that stuff. And it, uh, as soon as I read it, it was kind of apparent to me how to extend um, Wilson's thing to this. It seemed pretty straightforward. So I said, okay, I'll take it on. Okay, so that's how I ended up working with Wilson. And actually, so I was like jointly advised by John Wilkin and Ken Wilson. Wilson was the RG, numerical RG expert to whom I would go and I had to do you know, connect it with RC part. And John Wilkins was the quantum impurity problem condensed model. So I benefited from interacting with this. Okay. So that's how I ended up working. So you know I had a lot of so there were lectures on RT and the condo problem that Wilson gave. I attended that. And then uh, so there's an interesting thing about coding issues. So Wilson actually so the extension is actually pretty safe for Wilson gave me this, his, 
his computer code for solving the condo problem and said, why don't you just use that and make some modifications and use it for the anti security problem. The computer code about eight, 800 lines long, trust me, so you can say 1,000 lines of the order. And it was one program. There was not a single comment card in it, OK? And it seemed like many variable names and had been chosen just arbitrarily. There was a variable called XXXX. And there was another variable called Y, 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 Y. OK? <laughs> so I looked at it and said, boy, if I, if I modify this and something doesn't work, I'm not going to know what the hell I'm doing, you know? So I said, I told Wilson, no, I'm not going to use this code. I am going to write my own code. He said, OK, no problem. Yeah, they have no problem with that. So I sat, printed this code, and then went through it line by line, annotated it, figured out exactly what was going on in the code, and then you know rewrote my code completely, more in a very modular, with hundreds of comment cards. And I'm sort of actually very proud of my code. I you know, some 40 years later or something, I can look at my code and I can tell you exactly what's going on in, in the code that I wrote. And I, you know, I also lent it to other people, and they found it easy to use, and so on. But uh, Wilson scored an amazing thing. So I, I still, to this day, I wish I had kept a copy of it. Unfortunately, I didn't. For posterity, it would have been nice to show that code. But I have no idea how the hell he kept track of what was going on in the code. Maybe he wrote, you know, like how we would he debug it even, you know? Because maybe he wrote it. He had such algorithmic clarity. He was a fantastic programmer. So maybe he wrote the code and then it will it worked first time or whatever. Or he, despite he had like prodigious memory and he remembered, you know, whatever he called, irrespective of what name he gave to variables or not. Remember, I don't know, but that was the code. And and you know, my interaction with him was actually very brief because he was not a man of many words. If I had a problem, I would go to his office. And, or if I found a new result, I'd go to office. The, the uh, interactions are barely more than 10 minutes at a time, right? I would say, tell him what I'm finding, and he would kind of, you know, when I'm finding very new results and all, which nobody has seen until then. So I told them, he would sort of nod his head as if it makes sense to him, it's kind of obvious. So it was like slightly deflating for me, but he's a very nice guy. And then if I, I had any difficulty, I went to him, he would say, uh, I haven't thought about it, maybe uh, you can try this. And some other times he'll say, I haven't thought about it, I have no idea. So there's, there's no way to continue the conversation, you know. It's kind of difficult. Whereas Wilkins was somebody who could just, with, with whom we could talk talk or all kinds of things, including politics, and office, you know, very different personalities. So I, Learned a lot from both. Uh, Ken had an interesting approach to teaching. He taught teach courses in a very unusual, talk about very unusual things, which I don't know whether they were good for the graduate students or not. I mean, the students taking the course or not, but I was a TA for one of his courses on electromagnetic theory for undergraduate students. So there he was spending a lot of time teaching them how to use the computer for solving electromagnetic theory problems, whereas, you know, traditional courses. You focus only on the exactly analytically soluble thing. His emphasis was to tell you about numerical solutions. Like there's a way of solving for some, you know, Laplace equations, for example, with some bounding conditions by putting it on a lattice and then uh, successively averaging uh, nearest neighbor potential. So he thought all that. And there was another thing which he was working on called the GIFT project which uh, there's a little record of. So actually, it was a vision of something like Mathematica he had at that time, you know, of something that he could construct, which, uh, you know, where you have to just tell the program what you want to do, and it would figure out what uh, diagonalization routine to use, what other numerical routine to use, something else to use, and you could just, uh, you know, do it in like plain language or something. So he had that kind of vision. He was spending a fair amount of time working on it, but it didn't see fruition and, and then it got cut off, the grant cut off, they didn't pursue it. But it would have been like a precursor to mathematics and so on. So he was like an incredible guy. First, you know, then when I came back, it was difficult to keep in touch with him. As you know, in those days, 
there was no email there was only snail mail so despite that i actually carried on a collaboration with uh, a friend of mine called jay prakash where we worked on the two infinity problem i would work something out and send the mail to him and then 15 days later he would receive the mail and then then he would work something out and that one to it and 15 days later i would get the mail but we managed to collaborate still but anyway with with will wilson as i said i've told you on a few words it's difficult to keep in touch except when you know when i went to us and i would if i went to cornell uh, or later in to oil state i would run it and tell the about it but and uh, he won the nobel prize later i told him actually some guys in the that he actually responded to that that is the right of this so i have actually a lot of influence of ken in my own research and many more details of the stuff that i mentioned that he have actually given in our five article we can look it up so how much time i should five minutes okay so let me just briefly tell you about uh, some pictures so this is wilson as i always remember him you can see like he's got a mischievous smile always you know he would whenever i go to his office he would never irritate i've never seen him irritated he would you know i i never made appointments to see him i just walk in and he would be sitting at his desk and looking at something sometimes he would have his legs on this desk and then thinking deeply about something but he would always just you know uh, hear what i had to say etc and he rarely wore this tie and coat this is like a more when he became famous and then there would be visitors coming or some dignitaries coming and he had to attend reception and then all but earlier he would just every day he would be wearing the same color pant and shirt no he probably had many sets of gray pant white shirt and uh, you know very he would be wearing that and he would be sitting in the office with that okay. so okay so i show you the this thing so he met in 1975 he met alison brown whom i also knew actually uh because of their mutual interest in folk dancing group which i mentioned to you he met her in one of the folk dancing uh, uh, meetings and then they fell in love and they married in 1982 and actually she was a computer service expert and together with uh, another person called Douglas von Holland director of academic computing and uh, just recently they actually wrote a proposal to do some coding point array process and wilson wrote a fortran compiler for the array process he wrote the compiler okay so it's like it was many things rolled into one he was a computer scientist physicist mathematics and everything he could do whatever he wanted and then since then he got very interested in generating support he like began a campaign because they were already well known you know and then uh, very highly regarded so he began a campaign to gather more support for example in particular this latest case theory he wanted to solve and to solve that over the entire regime of energy he need he realized that you need computer you can't do it analytically okay so he started a campaign for increasing computing support to scientists and succeeded actually so in response to his a drive i mean and then of course supported many other people national science foundation started five national supercomputer facilities that was the first time they set it up and one of them was set up at cornell and wilson became the director of that so got embroiled in administration in 85 he didn't like it so he quit in 88 and went off to ohio state university but anyway so this is a picture that is one major event during this period Of course, the other major event was this Nobel Prize in '82. So this other picture here is Wilson and his wife, and you can see this is in a folk dancing thing. He is wearing a Scottish kilt. They are both wearing Scottish dresses. Okay. So this is the Nobel Prize um, declaration, and uh, this is Hans Bethe toasting Ken Wilson. At Cornell, and then that's actually a uh, Hans Bethe's facility called Dalmarais. He was one of the people who typed 
He typed all the thesis with complicated mathematics, including mine. Okay. So. Oops. Sorry, I forgot to put it in either. All right. And Uh, okay, so this is the Nobel Prize ceremony, and that's actually Wilson and his father. He's wearing whatever the dress, and that's Wilson and his father with the Swedish royalty who always graced the occasion. So, so how many pictures there are? Then he moved to Ohio State, and then he actually got involved, heavily involved in education. In fact, that was one of the reasons for removing UK education. I mean, he moved to Ohio State, so he did a lot of work on education, published many papers, including a book, and he was actually heavily involved in redesigning the education, which he felt was not good in the high school and college education. He was heavily involved in founding the National Foundation, National Education Research System. Uh, yeah. Continue to do some projects. But, you know, nothing of the kind of significant. I mean, you know, there are still really cited papers and non economic but nothing in the league of what he did, starting five different fields in Europe. Okay. So, many widely recognized with many, many awards, including the Nobel Prize. So, and then in some sources, you know, I'll make this PDF file of this available. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say. I'll just move to it. Uh, lots of more slides about the technical aspects of political phenomena, but the storytelling is kind of time. But I hope you have a good time. Uh, I've sort of toughly told you about that stuff, but it'll take me another half an hour at least to go through it, even if to tell you some idea of what is the condo problem, what is the RD solution, what is the Anderson security problem, what is critical phenomena and renowned relationships. So I'll avoid doing that. Okay, thank you very much for listening. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to quickly. Yeah, Pardon? During my time at Cornell, he rarely had large numbers of students, but he had students. Uh, so, you know, uh, there was another student from Bangladesh called Bilal Bhakti, who was working with him on, uh, who did his undergraduate at Caltech and then was working with him uh, on this uh, um, Gladys Gates. And then after that, there are other well-known people who have worked with him, Michael Peskin, who has uh, written this book on Christian and showed up on field theory. I don't know where, where I see it. He was a graduate student who was one year junior to me and he worked with Ken Wilson. And then uh, uh, um, Steve White, who invented the density matrix renormalization group. Uh, those of you who know, he was a graduate student working with Wilkins and Wilkins like me, jointly. They were trying to do some uh, problem applying renormalization to, to atoms and all that. So he was a student in Sir Judas, then he was a student in Sir Judas, and then he was a student in Sir Judas. He was a student in Sir Judas, and then he was a student in Sir Judas. Ginsburg was obviously also very heavily involved in all the archives and stuff. For a long time, he was like basically the mentor for physics archives and all that stuff. But he was ever grateful for the ease with which he can access papers. He would be grateful for the So he yeah, has many students. So Wikipedia has some list of Student not not complete, but he had probably some students. I never it was not like a group. I never had a group meeting, you know. 
So in fact, like you know, like this whole culture, uh, I know you know that, right? Many faculty members often have group meetings with their group of students. But I never had that with Wilson. Wilson, I used to attend John Wilson's group meeting. So he had this. So at any given time, I uh, you mentioned Nelson when you talked about... Oh, David Nelson. Oh, okay. He's a very famous uh, filmster. So he did this, uh, you know, the problem that Fisher gave him. It was very nice. You know, you know that the one-dimensional Ising model, I don't know whether you ever learned this stuff, right? 1D Ising model is exactly soluble. You can calculate the partition function, etc. exactly, right? So the first problem that Fisher assigned to David Nelson was to do it using renormalization. It's a, you know, very easily doable, but it's a very instructive exercise because it really gets you to learn with Fisher work like that, you know, and then he went on to do very many things. So actually there was another person at the time when I was at Cornell called uh, Postelis. You heard of him? Postelis Saulus Stein, he was a Nobel laureate. Okay. So he was at Cornell as a postdoc. He had just finished the seminal work with Howlett, uh, which he did during his PhD. And he was there at the time that I was uh, at Cornell. He was visiting at uh, Cornell. As a, he was there at Cornell as a postdoc. And he had a completely different way of doing renormalization. And he tried to do it in the context of that XY model, which is, like, in fact, a very different way of doing renormalization for the XY model. Uh, and he did that work while he was at, at Cornell. And Nelson started talking to him. And they figured out that it had an important application connected with uh, superfluid density, how it changes at the critical point. Yeah? And they could show that it has some universal value jump at the uh, critical point. It's zero at the normal phase and finite in the superfluid phase. And then the difference is a universal number. You take a calculate from this popular part. Then he, Nelson, became a Harvard Society fellow, a junior fellow, went to Harvard, worked with Halperin, and they there he did this dislo dislocation mediated theory of melting. I don't know whether you've heard about ecstatic phase and so on. So they were the ones to defect mediated melting of uh, crystal, where they showed that actually there's an intervening phase that is possible. Like in 2D, 2D crystal, crystalline phase and liquid phase, there's an ecstatic phase. So, everybody is well known. He's done many, many other things. Very well known. But more statistical mechanics. And he also done a lot of stuff on biophysics. So, he actually got in touch with me recently. Uh, likely to come to Bangalore for some um, school and ICS. So, keep a lookout. Uh, Maybe you can get the meeting to attend that school and, and conference. Yeah. It, it's going to be a good yeah. No, <laughs> I'm waiting on it. <laughs> well, I'm, so, you know, I have a certain luxury now. This is it, this that I don't have students who are my responsibility to be fair. So I actually interact very closely with uh, Manish, who you know told you all about the So I interact with Manish, Jane, and the two and the group, and so I attend all their group meetings. So we have a lot of fun doing very many different projects. Connected primarily recently, primarily with uh, there are these materials called twisted bilayers. I don't know if you've heard. Of. You could take one graphene layer and take another graphene layer. And twist them relative to each other. So you get this thing called Moire pattern. Right? So you get a super ladder. 
where by adjusting this angle, if the angle is the smaller the angle is, the larger the moire unit cell. So you can have a moire unit cell with uh, you know 10,000 atoms, yeah, carbon atoms, right? And it has all kinds of exotic properties, including flat band, superconductivity, and things like that, which can tune by gating this bilayer graphene, you know, triplet bilayer graphene. It seems to exhibit physics like triplet superconductivity, metamorphic superconductivity. Where, but you can just do it with one sample. Whatever you could get by many, many samples of triplets with different values of doping. You know, where each time you have to prepare the crystal separately. Here, one nice system, and you can put a gate and then tune the filling, and then you can reproduce what seems like a repetition of the triplet phase diagram, except that the energy scale is one Kelvin superconductivity instead of 100 Kelvin. Are very excited about the strong correlation physics. Yeah, so we are not gotten to the strong correlation part because that's as hard as the separate uh, superconductivity problem because you know it's still really unsolved. So one of my passions is that I keep going back to the Hubbard model and see if there's some other way of doing it and developing the normalization loop for that. So that problem is not solved because there is no small parameter there. So it's, it's like the flattest case scale that Wilson was struggling with. But there is no small parameter. And have to, to invent a renormalization loop which doesn't have to an expansion in a coupling point. And there is no epsilon to save you. You see that. And there is no d minus 4 to save you. So it's a very tough problem. So I keep working on that. Because I can work on some of these problems because there's no risk. In the sense, there's no student involved who I'll put at risk by assigning that problem. It just needs to go. I can work on this. That's actually one of the Little bit with money. I mean, whatever, all the interaction and all these things with it. And these other kind of long standing problems, very risky. High risk, high reward. If I fix these. Other questions. At that time? Oh, okay. Very interesting experience. Because actually, this, uh, the, whatever Wilson program that Wilson developed for doing the condo problem really challenged the computing power that existed at that time. So in fact, he found that the kernel computing facilities at that time, which was in the 74, 76, because remember the supercomputer things only came at 85. Okay? The kernel computing services at that time was not enough for his problem. So there was a machine called CTC 6600, okay? which uh, was in Berkeley. So, with, so Wilson was using that computer and I also used that computer to do my work on the Anderson impurity problem. So that problem and the question is how do you communicate with this computer at, at Berkeley? So there was a modem in, in Cornell. So what you you had to punch cards. Have any of you worked with punch cards? You, you guys would know Oh no, you know, it's like even when I, when we, when I went to IIT Kanpur, uh, IIT Kanpur, you know, one of the, you know, blessings of going there was that they had a computer there, one of the IBM uh, 1480 or something, I remember, right? In fact, I, before I went to MSC there, I went to IIT Kanpur as a science talent summer scholar for a summer school there. So right then, actually, you know, they introduced us to the computer. So basically there, at that time, you know, so the computer had a card reader. So there would be all these like oblong rectangular cards. And if you uh, punch, you know, if you type in on some card puncher, it would make holes in the card. You know, and there was that there was the ASCII code for whatever you were uh, typing. Okay. And so each line in the program would be one card like that. Or you can put a continuation uh, thing just like you would do continuation lines in program. So 
journal, I had to do that. I had to punch these cards and then uh, send them over. So the card, the modern ones, the card reader would read that, convert into a signal, they would present the cost of bonus to this thing, and I would be sitting there and then executed on the computer. And then the um, output would come to the return route, and then it would go into this card thing, which would punch out cards. And then I had to feed that into another thing, which would be a card reader, and then I would get a printout, whatever. So editing, everything had to be done like that. So that was the way I did. Towards the end of my stay at Cornell, it began to have terminals in, in, uh, at Cornell. And so on, of course, during that period, the uh, computing, you know, like all the interfaces that are went out, it very rapidly. But some of my work on, uh, you know, when I went to Illinois as a postdoc, I was spending part of my time visiting IBM, the Yorktown, like, I, I was like, I spent some time there. So, I, uh, I did a lot, I really missed the computing. Facilities for her. And Elena also had good computing. Uh, and by that time it has improved so slowly. But still, after I came here, they were completely cut off, so there was no question of uh, doing numerical work here. But actually, uh, at the time, the, the work I did with Wilson, we looked at only static properties you know, of the quantum security problems. So that's same method can be actually used to calculate dynamical properties, you know, spectral functions and all kinds of things. That, that required massively more computing. And I was completely out of it. We had no computer. We had one computer in IIST when I came. Like, actually, you can, in a second from Manhai, you will have lots of stories to tell you about what we, how we do do this. And it was funny. Because they had basically no very few uh, blocks for connecting to these computers and showing it to be a long story. What, what all we have to go through to compute in IIT initially. Yeah. Wait, wait. Use the mic. I can't, I can't record. I have, a, I have a hearing aid and okay. despite that, it's difficult. So, the story about your degree getting Ah, okay, I haven't told you that story. Okay. So in 1976, I sort of completed my work, written up by thesis, handwritten it, right? And then I had to get it typed. By then, I actually got an offer for a postdoctoral fellowship. So I went, uh, so I, uh, you know, wrote, wrote up this thesis and gave it to this person. I showed you a picture of called Velma Ray. Right? She was, she was only, you know, my thesis had lots of math, lots of equations, all kinds of things. Okay, so, she was the logical choice for the person to type it. Because, you know, those days, typing out equations, there was no latex and all, no? So, there was these uh, typewriters with balls, with symbols and all, no? So, you to, you know, if you want a Greek symbol, you have to put something. If you have some other symbol, you have to put another ball. She was just really expert at it. So everybody would, all the people who are doing theory research with maths would go and give it to her, right? And so she was like way behind schedule. So I gave her the thesis and then two months later she said, oh, sorry, uh, there were other people in line. So she couldn't get to it. So people said, okay, go off, uh, go off on your uh, post -off. And then when she finishes typing, I come back and submit your thesis. As you can see, people are very laid back about these formalities, like uh, Wilson, right? He went off after three years on a uh, junior fellowship and then came back some six months later and submitted. Here, in my case, what happened was uh, I went away. I never heard from Elma Ray. And somehow I also forgot that I had not actually <laughs> finished my thesis, you know? And then Wilson was away on and all. so it happened like nobody seemed to be worried about my thesis so I forgot about it and suddenly it, it clicked somewhere along the line maybe when I was thinking that I, I, I wanted to 
going to head back and all that. I said, oh, God, you know, I haven't got to take, so, anyway, I frantically called my mom, and by then, enough time had lapsed, so she felt guilty. Yeah, because, you know, the problem was that because I was not around, and somebody else would uh, speed talk her, and then she would sort of, you know, not necessarily respect the uh, order in which it was given. So she was very apologetic when I pressed her. Acted up and then I went back and defended the thesis. And then the how it happened, I got my degree in January 78. So actually, recently in October, Wilson died. Uh, one of my classmates was at the time, uh, Jeevak Parpia, who was a classmate at Cornell, he was the chair of the department. So they dug up all the students' thesis. So he actually framed this uh, certificate. Uh, saying that I have completed my requirement, signed by Wilson, and he framed it in and it was very nice. Yeah, and dated from the Yeah, yeah, actually, they just type one copy. Maybe, we, I don't know, they, I don't think we use carbon because I didn't buy them Xerox things are available or whatever. So, uh, she make one copy and then, uh, then in principle you could make copies of it. So, I had a bound copy of my piece with me. I, I didn't know which place it, I don't know where it is now. But also, at that time, in a Cornell actually had a facility, my advisor, John Wilkins, he got uh, many, many copies of my pieces made, uh, and as it was put out as a you know materials as bulletin or something like, and it was like circulated to many people. So many people would have seen my pieces, including like Philip Nozier, uh, and uh, he's another famous thing. He has written this book on uh, interacting from me on some other like, uh, so he read my pieces because of the circulation. Yeah. So a lot of people had access to it, but it was done in this way. But I think maybe by it was copied and bound and sent to people. Yeah. So, another question? Okay, if not, uh, so let us thank uh, HRK uh, for his nice, uh, very nice talk. And now uh, I would like to um, uh, felicitate HRK uh, through our director, Professor A. Sinivasan. Thank you, Professor Sinivasan, and uh, thanks again, Professor Krishnamurti. Thank you all for attending this talk. So now I invite you all for this uh, tea outside. <laughs>